Um, um, Heike, co-founder, chief product officer of FitMe. Yeah. All right, glad, glad to be here. It's been, what, now almost six months that FitMe belongs to Rakuten family. And uh, when we started this journey years ago, um, quite honestly, people came to me and said, uh, I must be completely crazy because what we started out was putting together two worlds that normally don't even speak to each other, and that would be the world of biorobotics engineering and the world of fashion. Now, I'll get to this biorobotics engineering and robotics bit in a, in a second, but before this, let me uh, talk a bit why we started this journey. And, well, we, my, my previous background was in uh, e-commerce logistics and fashion retail, and, and what I saw was, was something online makes it just so difficult for the shoppers to buy, buy clothing. I mean, how many of you are constantly buying clothing online? Let me guess, not many. And the, the, one of the reasons for this is buying clothing online is almost completely opposite from the consumer experience point of view compared to buying clothing in, in stores. In stores, the, the experience is quite simple. By the way, can I, uh, does this microphone work? Can I walk around? Yeah. Okay, so um, buying clothing in, in stores is quite simple. You, you go and you browse and, and then you try something on and only after trying on, you will buy something, right? Thank you. And, uh, but online, it's exactly the opposite. You, yes, you do browse on those category pages and product pages, but then you are forced to buy, and only when this package arrives at home can you try something on. And more often than not, when this package arrives, you don't really like it. Maybe it doesn't fit, maybe you don't like the fabric. The retailers haven't been able to communicate fully every aspect of this clothing on the screen of the computer. And that's why selling clothes online is so bloody difficult. Retailers, literally, they, they have to do the sales twice. First, when they show this picture on the screen to you, and they, they convince you to take this risk to buy the item, and the second time when this package arrives and you, you decide to actually keep it, right? Now, what we did at FitsMe, um, we have two different types of services that help retailers communicate the fit information. And the first one uh, we call the Fit Advisor, it really asks very few simple questions from the consumers. It asks your height, your weight, your age, and then it asks uh, where your body proportions, how, how does your weight fall in different parts of the body, so you have to say whether you are big at chest or bust, or, or slim or big at, at waist. And based on this, we can calculate your body measurements quite exactly. Interestingly, we have to use different algorithms for these calculations for our European shoppers and for our Japanese shoppers because of the body shape differences are quite, quite dramatic here. And then, we need to know something else about you. As you look around here, some people prefer to wear the garments quite slim or tight-fitting, and some people prefer to wear them oversized. So we have to know the people's preference, the fit preference, whether uh, which category, how you would personally like to wear something. And when we have this data about you, your body, your fit preferences, and we have the garment data, then we can put all of this together and recommend you that in this particular item, you might be size medium. I'm a size uh, large in Timberland. I'm a size XXL in Abercrombie & Fitch. I'm size medium in Zara. You can guess which brand I like the most. Actually, it's Abercrombie. But, but I do feel pretty good being size medium, right? Um, it's vanity sizing that the retailers use to confuse the shoppers even more. And this, of course, uh, makes it incredibly risky for shoppers to buy something online when there's no size standardization 
the US brands trying to sell something to the Japanese market, well, their size medium is, is you can put two people into this, right? Into the size of Texas, which they produce shirts in. But so, developing those algorithms was, is actually really, really complicated. And how we started this journey was we created those shape-shifting robotic mannequins. You literally push the button and the robot goes from slim to muscular. I just wish my scientist would create a button I can push myself and my own body would do that. And so, let me show, let me show how it, how do I get the video running? Well. So literally, this, uh, this mannequin would start growing and it, it can take about 100,000 different body shapes and sizes. It, it can represent people in, uh, uh, from, from Texas to China, different, different eating habits or sports habits. Literally, it can do everything out there. And now imagine we can put the garments on this, on this robotic mannequin and we shoot the series of photos of each garment. We end up making between 500 to 2,000 photos on different sizes of garments and different body shapes and sizes of people. And what it helps us do is we, we can show those images to the online shoppers. After the shoppers have entered their body measurements, we can then show a, a model which is the same shape and size as the shopper themselves. This is a picture of the robotic mannequin. We have just digitally edited out the robot and replaced it with, with, a, with a model. You can check it out at hugoboss.com and on Rakuten Ichiba. We are also launching in, in uh, quite soon with this, with, uh, starting with select brands. So you can literally try the size, size uh, eight on this mannequin or size, size 18 you can literally see just how loosely or tightly every single garment would, would look on you. Now, in essence, what we do is not, you know, if you thumb it down, it's not complicated. We take the inputs, we take the consumer body, body measurements, the biometric data, we take the fashion preferences, the fit, fit preferences, and we take the garment measurements, the garment data. We put it together into this algorithm and it calculates uh, either the the fit recommendation, the size recommendation, or it shows one of those pre-made photos to the uh, shoppers. And this was the journey that we started. And then we realized that when you come up with a technical idea that works here, suddenly the idea might be much, much bigger. It can do something much more than simply helping the consumers buy more items. Perhaps it can, it can impact the whole vertical of the fashion industry because what we do here, we collect this data of the shoppers and we can provide this data back to the retailers so that retailers can start making better choices, better marketing, better production of, of garments. Let me use an example here. Um, now, I guess every one of you have walked down the street and suddenly there's this shop uh, selling, selling just amazing fashions. Everything they sell is amazing. You walk in, there's great music playing and, and you just love what you see. You, could, you walk out with this three bags full of cool stuff. And next door, there's another shop, which unfortunately is the boring shop. You walk in, and there's nothing of interest whatsoever. The problem there is that actually we know that that boring shop has cool stuff. The cool stuff is somewhere in the back, back shelves. And because you can't find it, you don't buy it. And this is what big marketplaces like Rakuten, eBay, Amazon, any other, well, you can call it the whole internet, 
does. It mixes up the pool shops with the boring shops, and then when you go and search for shirts or dresses or sweaters, you will be displayed with those thousand items. It's like a wave of products thrown, thrown your way. And it's very, very difficult to find the one that you actually like if it's buried, it's hidden between those boring items. If, however, you can filter those results so that each shopper is shown only those items that are really relevant to their interests, not only the items that they like, but also what they can buy in terms of that the merchant selling them has the item in size, in stock that fits the shopper. Only then suddenly the e-commerce starts really changing rapidly and dramatically because then it's easier to buy clothing online than it is in stores. Those engineers who can crack this key will be responsible for many lost jobs in retail when the shops will be closing. Well, it has happened already with bookstores, but it will surely be happening in fashion. But in fashion, it's a much more complicated story. You cannot filter the results by searching for beautifully pink shirt that Carlos here is wearing, or a checkered blue and something shirt. I mean, how do I even describe this using words? What instead you need to do, you have to get under the skin into the brain of the shopper to create the shopper's fashion DNA. And that, from an engineering point of view, is a extremely complicated thing. How would, you, how would you describe what a person really wants? I mean, you might walk into a shop seeing those beautiful shoes on the window. Then you browse around and you leave with a backpack. A great fashion search filtering and discovery engine is something that will show you those shoes but also those backpacks that will make browsing for fashion an addictive game where you want to go click because you want to see that next item and click because you want to see that next item and you go back again and again and again to see more of those cool stuff like on Pinterest. And as a result, not only are shoppers shopping much more online, it becomes this virtuous cycle, a competitive edge, really. Let me explain. When FitzMe currently focuses on communicating the fit, how the garments will fit you to each single shopper, yes, it helps the shoppers to buy more, to make this transaction in a situation where they are hesitant, whether it whether it's the right size or not. Um, it will help especially those shoppers who are first time online, online shoppers, the most frightened about the experience uh, to turn from offline into internet shoppers. So it uh, helps acquire new customers. But it also helps to turn those customers into repeat buyers because when their experience is happy experience the first time they buy, they can come back to buy more. In the process, though, we collect the data on those shoppers. We collect data on millions of shoppers, of body measurements and, and fit preferences and style preferences. I could put it in a way, we have a virtual way to look into people in the fitting rooms. If that would be the real stores, we would probably be put into jail for this. So we see those people in the fitting rooms during the purchase decisions to buy something, and perhaps more importantly, when they decide not to buy something. We can analyze this and help the retailers understand what changes they would need to do. They can take this information and change how the market thinks. So as, an, as a very simple example would be uh, Rakuten Super Sale, where retailers sell the stuff quickly. It's an end of season stuff quite often. 
there's um, items that are out of stock in many sizes. So instead of pushing you 70% uh, off email campaign, where you go and click on the first, first shirt that you like and it's out of stock, and then you click on the next one and it's out of stock in your size, and you click on the next one and it's out of stock, I mean, how long will you continue? It can pre-personalize the email so that if they have a overstock of size XXL, this campaign only goes to those XXL people. Or, or when you come to this shop, it's pre-personalized to show only the sizes that are available in, in, your, si in your size. It surely increases GMS. But not just this. Based on this data, the retailers are also seeing what sizes they should have been selling, but they didn't because they hadn't, didn't have anything in stock. They might see that, for example, I'm an example here. Look at the fat thick, thick neck here, right? So 17% in the UK are like me. Most retailers are not carrying shirts that I can button up. See, I can. It would be 17% of lost business. But now they can analyze this data. They can go back and, and change the designs of the garments. Go back to manufacturing to start manufacturing garments that actually fit their target groups. If the retailer then decides to go to a, a Chinese market or the US market or the Finnish market, they can go there with the, the power of this data that helps them produce exactly the stuff that is needed there. Did you know that fashion is one of the industries which pollutes the world the most in the manufacturing side? If they can optimize the manufacturing to produce more of the stuff that people actually need, it's one of those technology bits that actually makes the world a better place. But then it becomes, well, a virtuous cycle because we get the data of the garments, we start communicating to the, to the uh, shoppers again, and, and it goes round and round. Now, from merchants' point of view, though, for the first time in history, even tiny merchants would be able to access this data. Until now, only the big companies like Nike or Adidas were able to pay for those hugely costly research and consumer, consumer purchasing habits and, uh, and, and shop, uh, shoppers' body data. Now even the smallest one would have access to this, which means that merchants who use a platform that can give them this additional information, compared to merchants who don't use this platform, are in a huge advantage, competitive advantage. They are almost like locked in, jailed to this particular platform. Until, of course, there's other platforms who can provide the similar, similar information. Now, given that uh, this is an incredibly interesting topic, it's in the UK, 22% of clothing is already sold on online. Here in Japan, only 5%. Now just imagine the huge growth that is going to happen here. Some of the things we can maybe look at the UK market and use those, those what we've learned there to apply to Japanese market, knowing fully well though that Japanese consumers are different. We can't simply copy stuff from there. But we do know there's a disruption happening right now in clothing e-commerce and therefore in clothing retail. In the UK, over the next five years, some analysts believe that one in five clothing shops will start closing. It's one of the biggest retail sectors with some of the biggest number of people employed there. It's a huge shift coming. And those, those people who, who create those maybe tiny technologies, maybe bigger ones, it's an amazing place to be when you can see that what you have created actually goes and impacts the whole big sector. It's, um, I've, I've always believed it's, it's very easy to forecast future if your job is to create it. Um, if any of you are in, uh, in particularly in fashion retail uh, verticals or, or of interest uh, topics that obviously I didn't cover that might be the offline to online areas, um, merchant processes, how to make uh, 
shoppers more satisfied uh, to the returns process, any of those topics, I'd be happy to cover them some, some other day. But thank you. Thank you very much, Heki. And I guess, uh, do we still have one minute for a quick questions? Do anybody has some questions? If not? Uh, if not, I still have one question for you. Like, um, when people are buying clothes on the internet, how? What's the difference between in Japan and in Europe? So, what's your ideas? Thank you. It's I, I mentioned I mentioned one thing that in the UK, 22% of clothing is sold online today, right? In Japan, it's only 5%. In the UK, one in four garments bought online, the shop has returned to the merchants. In Japan, it's only 5%. Huh. Big differences, right? Um, the, the theory about this is that in Japan, it's more inconvenient to return something. Um, people don't feel it uh, comfortable doing this. Plus, uh, oftentimes, the retail does not pay for return shipping. So it's costly, and it, it takes time to take the package somewhere. And therefore, because it's the risk of buying something online is higher. I also buy much less online. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, do we have time? Just as quick follow-up question. Do you, how do you see customer experience as one uh, cause of people in Japan buying less online? Because I am European, and retail in Europe sucks, I'm sorry. But <laughs> in Japan, it's really nice. You get treated really nice, so I even love to go to shops here because they, you know, they pack every tiny little thing with so much patience. And so how do you see that? I love shopping in Japan, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to go tomorrow. And, and, and uh, the stuff here is just so cool. Um, I wish you would be selling this online using uh, using Fitzmaurice technology so I can buy it uh, when I'm back in London and Est Estonia. But the truth is that uh, uh, shopping in stores is pain in the ass, whether it's in Japan or whether it's in, in Europe. And you have to physically go somewhere, uh, browse through hundreds, if not thousands of items, and where is it going to be easier, in stores or online? Yes, it might be fun here in Japan right now, um, it's also fun in Selfridges in London, right? But, oh, hi, Rats. Um, but truth is that give it a few more years and, and technology is going to be so much better that shopping online will surely overshadow shopping in stores. Stores, however, will still remain. They will not disappear altogether. If one in four closes, three in four will still stay open. Okay, I'm sorry, we need to stop here because we are running out of time. So thank you again for Heki. Yeah, good speech. Thank you all. And if you still have questions, you can come to talk with Heki. And next session will start in 12 minutes and it's about the music technology. So don't miss it.